Hey, welcome to Truth Unbound. This is your host, Walter Swain, once again, and I'm glad you're with me once again. I really value that, and I value the fact that you would spread the word about Truth Unbound and share it with others so that they can join uh, join in and listen to what God's Word says to the trending issues and general questions about the Bible, God, life, uh, the culture, ish, issues in the culture that are going on presently, and all those things we look at it in light of God's Word. Word. And here's where we're going to begin with today. We've been taking from a series called You Won't Believe It, But. And today it's this. You won't believe it, but Christians really don't hate everybody. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but it may be not so much as a question this week as it is a statement that is said in various forms or another, but saying the same thing. And that is that Christians tend to be hateful. They just are just down on life. They're down on people. We, you know, they, they know more about what we're against than what we're for. And uh, there's some truth to that. And then there isn't. And that's what we're going to talk about today and find out what is our response and understand really what's going on with that in the culture abroad. This isn't just in our nation, but also across the world. And it's become very popular, more popular, especially in the last five to 10 years. Uh, it's become more acute for people to say, I, I don't want to have anything to do with Christianity because of Christians. Yeah, well, is that true? Is that a fair, is that a fair uh, understanding of what Christians are and what they feel and what they say and what they do? every day around us. What, what is the real answer to this? And how as believers, followers of Jesus, true followers of Jesus, how should we respond to that? We're going to find out. So let's go. Hey, all right, just before we jump in, just remember to do this, if you would, please, and that is to click on like, Tap on all notifications as you do that. And then also click to follow this podcast. If you're listening through a, through another app or type of listening or watching uh, app of the podcast. And then also if you would share it, you share the link, whether on Facebook or uh, do it through uh, texting or WhatsApp or whatever it is, just spread the word about Truth Unbound and let's see our family grow. We're over 600 subscribers right now. And uh, that just happened this week. So we continue to grow more and more each week. And I'm so excited about that, and I know you are too. Well, all right, let's jump into it. Ready? Go. Okay, the The point today is this, is that many are saying that Christians are hateful. They're mean to others. And that has become a real barrier to followers of, followers of Jesus who are genuinely trying to grow their relationship with Jesus Christ and to just honestly live for him and love people for Jesus while at the same time standing for God's truth. You may have run into this at work or at school or at college or even in your extended family. And that rejection of Christian, in other words, biblically centered, Christ centered values, values and beliefs and lifestyle are often on the chopping block. They're, they, we are observed closely and rightfully so, and even raised to a higher standard many times because we say we follow Jesus. And I understand that. But here it's going into the area of saying that, well, but you Christians, you're just so mean to everybody, especially uh, homosexuals or transgender or you're, you're too political. We're going to look at some of the reasons as to why this is going on and why Christians are receiving this kind of judgment passed on them. So let's find out what those are. Okay, so why do people have an aversion to Christians? They avoid them or dislike them. Why do you think that is, according to experiences you've had with it? Why do people, the unbelieving people, often say or feel like Christians are so hateful toward people? Well, we can definitely know this, is that there's two reasons why Christians and churches are often rejected or accused of this. Number one, it's because Christians are not living like Jesus as they should. And number two, it can also be because many Christians are living like Jesus, as they should. Now, with this first type, the rejection due to our walk not looking like our talk, we can and need to do something about that. Now, 
with the second reason, the second type, which is rejection, because we are living righteously for Christ, we can't do much about that or the world's reaction to it and what it will be. But let's let's focus again on that first thing. Many Christians not living like Jesus as they should. What do we mean by that and what needs to be done about that? David Kinnaman, in his 2007 book called Unchristian, What a New Generation Really Thinks About Christianity and Why It Matters, he lists these reasons, and they still stand true today. Number one, because they're hypocritical. Number two, they're, they're just making people a notch on their gospel gun, if you will. I just, you're just an object of conversion for them to other than other belief. The other is being anti-homosexual. Of course, today, today it would be anti-transgender and, and anti-non-binary, anti-anything like that. The other is, is, well, Christians are so sheltered. They have no connection to the real outside world. They live in this bubble. And then also because Christians are so judgmental. And also this, and this is incredibly popular today, this reason for why Christians are avoided or accused of being hateful, and that is they're too political. Now, again, let me ask you, do you think that that's justified? Is that, is, is that true, many of these are reasons? I think many of them are, and I think many times it is justifiable, the accusation toward believers in Christ for being this way. That is a problem and needs to be resolved. But we also mentioned the second reason is because Christians are living like Jesus. In other words, they really are sincerely and fairly consistently living according to the way God wants the believer to live. And that is the problem. For instance, if we love some people that the world says we should be rejecting, then we'll be rejected. If we are speaking or about or living consistently with the values that reflect the values and righteousness of God, the things that God loves and the things that God hates, the world isn't going to like that. I can remember in the first days and weeks after the death of George Floyd, if you said the words, all lives matter, then you would get burned at the stake. You'd get skewered. But the thing is, is that is a biblical value and a statement. In other words, no single life matters unless all lives matter. And all people matter to God, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their their cultural background, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of their socioeconomic level. All lives matter to God. And so every single life matters. And that's a biblical truth that we cannot change and, and don't want to. It's, it's what God says. It's what makes everyone so special. You're made in the image of God, and you're loved by God. No matter who you are or what you've done, you can find salvation in Christ. And Christians are to love everyone equally. You can remember the old song, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we should be that way as believers, loving everyone equally. I can remember one time on Facebook, I was part of a a youth pastor's page. And it was was there for, you know, to to exchange ideas and about games and activities and events and how to do things and forms that you can share and use to to help events go along better or and be used for them or any kind of ideas on sermon series or less Bible study lessons and talking about the Bible study lessons, somebody had asked uh, on the on there. On the, on the Facebook page, excuse me, about what kind of curriculum do you use to teach against racism? And of course, immediately, so many people threw up the book that is just incredibly horrible uh, called White Fragility, written by Robin D'Angelo. That was their text. And so as people were going down the line and listing that, I just simply put on there, remember, this is for evangelical youth pastors and leaders and helpers. I said, well, at our church, we're just teaching the Bible, that Jesus loves everyone, and that we are to do so as well, and that he died on the cross for everyone, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their culture, background, and et cetera. 
And I said, so we're just teach the Bible, just teach the simple truths of God and his love and the way that we should be as well in following him and imitating him. And I got piled on by Christians about stating a biblical truth. And so there's, that's a problem when that is there in the church, and no wonder the world's confused either way as to where we stand or as to how we treat other people. Well, one of the main reasons this happens and why there's such a judgmental attitude of the world against Christians is because they're, because of the built-in bias built into the news media and social media and that just this uh, the, where the Christians are painted as being anti-intellectual and they're just not in the know and they don't understand and and they're, they're just so basic and and they're painted as Bible thumpers that are just have no idea how the real world works and so that bias alone is already there from the get go and that's that's no surprise and probably some of you before you became believers were there you know what that was like you know what that means it's just and it's it's rooted in sin it's rooted in sinfulness and so that is part of the main reason why christians are accused of this can remember i can remember in acts 11:26 where it says the believers were first called christians in antioch you see um the Christianity had grown cr after the persecution in Jerusalem the, uh, by the Jewish leaders there. The Christians spread out through the then known world in the Roman Empire and tried to resettle and start new lives in other places. Antioch was one of those cities. And so in that city, the believers were becoming known um, because the ch a church began there. And it began to grow, and so the community and the people of the city began to see and know who these Christians were. Now, that, 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 back in that time, believers called themselves either uh, disciples or followers, called them saints or literally holy ones, uh, brethren, brothers, compatriots, of, in other words, of the same family or nation, uh, like we said, disciples, followers, uh, or also people of the way. But it was also a practice back then in the culture, the Roman culture, to calling someone by the group or city or person uh, that they followed. In other words, they were accused of being groupies or adherents to this certain general or emperor or popular prom prominent person. Those who were uh, that followed uh, closely followed Pompey, were called Pompeians, and the Augustine were, was the Augustinians. And we keep doing that today. If you're, I'm from Miami, so I'm originally from Miami, so I'm called a Miamian. Or you live in Houston, you're a Houstonian, and, and uh, such and such. So uh, this is what was done in the Roman times as a type of wordplay to kind of be dismissive of somebody. Uh, and then, of course, it grew to be more of a derogatory, derogatory term. And so this was applied to the Crestians because they followed Crestus, okay, Jesus Christ. And so being like him or living like him or of that type of, of uh, culture or that follower, then people were starting to call the believers Crestians or Christians, as we would call it now. And so we see that that was a way of really mocking the followers, but eventually the name became, or the label Christian, uh, just became a description of the people that were following the Bible and God's word and, and Christ. Another reason uh, that this happens toward Christians is because they are painted as enemies of the state. They're labeled subversive, such as like when Christian parents are just simply concerned at at uh, school board meetings about what their children are being taught and being exposed to, and so they're labeled domestic terrorist. That kind of enemy of the state uh, picture being painted with a broad brush over all those who are believers in these types of meetings, for instance. Now, maybe many of you remember in your history books and history class, <laughs> I'm sure it comes right to your mind, that uh, in the year 64 A.D., the city of Rome, 70% of the city of Rome burned down, leaving half of its population homeless. And Nero, the emperor, was accused of having set that fire that eventually burned down so much of Rome. Now, politician and historian Tacitus wrote about what Nero did to cover up what he was accused of and to deflect to others. And guess who he deflected that to? the Christians. 
So when we come out and we speak or stand up or take action uh, against abortion or maybe have sincere religious uh, reservations about taking the COVID vaccine, or we stand up against the government's overreach to control the church as to when it could meet as what happened during the COVID period, or against same-sex marriage or transgender policies in, in school districts and in government how buildings and, and such. When we uh, take a stand against these things or just casting a vote for it, which is our democratic liberty, liberty to do so, then we are maligned and we are, we are accused of being enemies of the state or against trying to uh, go against democracy or ruin or destroy democracy. And so we're canceled or we're censored because of, of expressing uh, biblically-based beliefs concerning these things. And so pay the, another, another method that is used to bring this judgment against Christians as being hateful of everybody is to paint all Christians with the same brush. In other words, when a small group or a person or persons who say they're Christians without seeing the evidence of if they really are or not, but they say they are, and then they do something hateful or mean, and which is against scripture, such as what happens with the famous Westboro Baptist Church, which is, well, never mind, I won't go there, uh, but I stand against them as well. But nevertheless, because I'm a Christian, I can be painted and often am uh, if I express an opinion about something that is against the more popular opinion, well, then we're all thrown in the same sack. We're all painted with the same broad brush that all believers are just like them. All Christians are hateful like them, which couldn't be farther from the truth. So why is this from the heart? Why does this bias come against us? Well, Jesus said this in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And then again in John chapter 15, verse, eight, verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And so what Jesus is expressing here is that we should not be surprised. We should know this. And this is going to happen. Whereas if we live in the light, we live out the biblical principles and values that he's given to us to know and believe and to live by, then that will throw light on the evil deeds of others. And they don't like that and they reject it. And so they're going to deflect from it and show it back on, on the believer many times. And, and it's just part of the territory. It just goes with the territory of following Christ faithfully and openly and publicly. So how should we respond to the first question? Going back to that, what should we as Christians do about the perception that, well, we hate everybody, but, the, but ourselves? <laughs> Jesus said this in John 13, verses 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now notice here, Jesus didn't say they'll know you are mine because you have great theological knowledge and a degree in it. Or you won top prize in the church potluck four years in a row. Or they'll know you're mine because you have the Bible memorized. Or because you pray so eloquently in public. Or your political speeches or your Facebook posts are just so amazing. No, he said it will be because of agape love. He said, as I have loved you, that self-sacrificial serving love toward each other. 
I can remember one time years ago in my home church, they had teams of men who would do repairs for those who couldn't pay for it in their own home. And and so uh, they started with those in the church. And my mom was a widower. Uh, I was off and away as a missionary uh, with my family in another country. And I was home on furlough one time. And so these men stopped by while I was there. Uh, we were having a short break coming home and I was trying to figure out how I can do some of these things. And they showed up one day at our house and they uh, came and many of these guys were sheetrock workers themselves. And so they, my mom had this hole in the ceiling of the, what we call the utility room where the washer and dryer was and all those things. And so they came in there and they fixed that hole in no time. And so as they're walking out with their tools and everything, my neighbor happened to be, be outside when we were out talking to some of the guys and, and uh, she asked, she says, what are they, what are these guys doing here for your mom? And and I said, well, this, these are guys from my church. And I said, they're, they're here to, uh, they came and fixed a, a hole that was in my mom's ceiling. And she was really thrown off by that. She says, really? I've never seen that before. And so it was an opportunity to invite her to church and to know these people, through these people, know our Jesus and know the good news from Jesus and about him. And so as we show love in true, practical, visible ways as a local church family committed to one another, when we show that to each other, when we forgive one another, when we've maybe done each other wrong in some way, or we're there with them, each, we're there for each other in the midst of pain and suffering in our life, uh, then these things speak of the love of Christ. Jesus said, that's how they will know you're mine that you're my followers. Okay, I get it. But what about our response as believers to the second problem, which was what should we as Christians do about ridicule and rejection for living a godly life for Jesus? Now, I'm not talking about godly life of just being nice or just not causing trouble with people. I'm talking about living godly, even if others disagree or even angrily push back against what you feel or believe or stand firm on uh, and for your family and your child raising, your school, your marriage, your community, where your walk does match your talk to a large degree, speaking or standing with those as well who are, who are maligned or hated and are the victims in society and injustices occur. That's what we're talking about when we are ridiculed for living that way for Christ, like Christ would live and did as we see him in the word and in the gospels. In his great sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter five, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, would they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, for the longest time, to be honest, I thought that that pa passage meant whenever we share, being persecuted for sharing the gospel with somebody, like talking about, re, you know, witnessing about Christ to somebody in the street. He said, if you're, re, if you're persecuted for living in, for righteousness sake, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, that means it's much broader than just sharing the gospel. It's for any kind of righteous biblical living, speaking, writing, broadcasting, or actions that you take uh, for or against whatever God is for or against. And he said, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And the Old Testament prophets, prophets were hammered, persecuted, even martyred many times, not just for preaching the message to turn and repent and believe in God, but for speaking God's truth to power, for refusing to do what the world says you must do against God's clearly stated commands or suffer the consequences. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to always pick a fight or hope we get into one. And that's where the, the, that's where the problem begins many times is because some believers do and they ruin it for the rest who are simply trying to live peaceably yet honorably and righteously within this world, which is very unrighteous. We are to speak God's truth against moral corruption 
at the same time provide God's alternative way, the higher way, to do what is the morally right thing to do. Let me give you an example of that last one. It is a newer, more uh, frequent use now by pro-choice activists to say that you Christians are only pro-birth, but not pro-life after birth, which is a false and straw man argument. In the latest statistics, you can look this up yourself on the internet, there are over 2,700 pregnancy centers. These are Christian-run serving over 2 million people at a cost of $266 million, while there are 720 abortion centers in the U.S., and they are supported by the fees that they charge to be able to do your abortion. Now compare those two things, and I think you'll find that we are not just pro-life, pro-birth, we are pro-life from beginning to end. I can recall the words of Peter in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 through 20, where he says this, But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You see, we are to live the righteousness of Jesus openly in our lives, both privately and openly, publicly, no matter what the cost is. But we're again, let me emphasize, we're not to be picking a fight where there is none. We're not to be ugly and rude and forceful as the world is. We can be uh, living the righteousness of God, but also be respectful, just as Jesus was, even under his own, uh, in the middle of his own suffering. He was still respectful. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing good evil. And so let's go a step further, follower of Jesus. I'm speaking to you. And that is what we learned from this today also teaches us this, is that maybe you have uh, been accused of being mean-spirited or hateful because, well, maybe in a moment you did appear to be that way, or you were with someone. It, maybe not even what you said, maybe it was biblically correct, but your attitude and behavior and your words were not. And so to ha ask for a reboot between you and the person that you've offended, the unbeliever that you've offended, uh, just ask for their forgiveness. forgiveness. Just, hey, I, I really blew this. I, I shouldn't have responded to you like that. You were just expressing your opinion about what we were talking about or what we saw, and, and I wasn't very respectful, and I'm, I apologize for that. Will you forgive me? And that alone could go a long way toward being and living more like Jesus with them and maybe it can open a door once again to where you can express the truth of the gospel of Jesus to them in the right way. Also remember this, that if sometimes when you're accused of being a hateful Christian, it's a facade, it's a deflection, because you, they're feeling convicted inside by the Holy Spirit because of the light that your life, your words, your actions in a good and loving way even, yet firmly showing the light of Christ, uh, brought, revealed their deeds, their evil deeds. And so it, they, people don't like that. I didn't like that. You know, when I was convicted of my sin, you, and, and you don't like that when you're convicted of your sin, but you know, it's necessary to be able to ask God to forgive you and to turn away from that and live the way he wants you to. And, and so that's what's happening inside of them, even if they don't realize it at the moment. So remember that. So again, just continue loving them in Jesus name, as you continue to live for Jesus and his righteousness. Maybe you're one of those today that are saying, asking the question, why are Christians so hateful to people? Well, the reality is, is they're not. Not those who are sincere believers and followers of Jesus. We don't hate anybody. Forgive, forgive us if we have given that impression in some way. But just know this, that above all things, look to Jesus. Jesus is the one 
that you need to be looking to, to find the answers and to find the hope. Well, I hope that this has helped everybody that's uh, watched this or listened to this today. And I want to remind you, if you would, remember to click on like and to, sh- to follow this podcast, to share it with others, comment, reply. And I try to respond to every comment that I can. And just remember this in the end, as always, follow Jesus. Because if you follow Jesus, you'll always follow the truth. <laughs>